right, hi everybody. So now we're gonna talk about chapter eight, which is relationships, uh, and talk about some of the major terms here. So the main thing that we tend to get from relationships and why humans are sort of pack animals, right? We're like wolves. We like to associate with other people is social support. So this is a feeling of being cared for and having support and assistance from people around us, including family, friends, and romantic partners. So there's different types of social support. So informational is giving advice or ideas to help us figure out strategies or resources to cope with things going on. Instrumental is tangible assistance. So maybe uh, you lend a friend money or uh, you, know, you can provide goods or services. And then emotional is enabling others to feel nurtured or cared for. There are different coping strategies that come into play here. So tend and befriend is nurturing and pro uh, protecting others in terms of in times of stress and developing social networks that facilitate these. Um, so this is a pattern of response to stress that um, we actually didn't discover uh, until we started studying not only women but female animals. Shocking. But the funny thing is, is like we don't just see it in women or female animals. We see it in male animals and men too. Um, but we didn't really notice it until we did that. Active constructive responding is a positive pattern of interacting that involves responding enthusiastically to a conversational partner and asking follow-up questions to prolong the conversation sense of excitement. So this is basically you're talking to your best friend and you just really enjoy the conversation and it all flows naturally. Co-rumination is extensively discussing problems and dwelling on negatives in conversation with another person, which can actually increase stress. Um, so sometimes this venting is good, right? But if this is all you all ever talk about, it can be problematic. All right, relational aggression is really important to talk about here. Um, so this is damaging others existing or potential relationships and or social status. Um, and this is the movie Mean Girls. The movie Mean Girls is all relational aggression, okay? Um, so this is really about uh, backstabbing, spreading rumors, things like that. So you're not punching someone, but you're doing things that can still really hurt, right? So women uh, and girls are more likely to engage in relationship aggression, whereas boys and men are more likely to engage in physical aggression. Generally, those who are socially powerful use relational aggression as a tool against those who are less powerful. And those who are less powerful end up being the victims of this. Um, Identity-based bullying is aggression directed towards people who are actual or perceived members of a devalued social group. So this could be racially based. Uh, it could be you're not the cool kids, right? It could be socioeconomic based and it could be really a combination of all those things. So your book talks about these prescriptions about romance perpetuated by the media that are really problematic. Um, so like, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the idea about sexual perfection, that sex with your soulmate is always easy and satisfying, right? Um, and uh, into a prince from a beast, the idea that love can change a man into an ideal partner, um, uh, that you are uh, incomplete without a mate, that you can't live a fulfilled life unless you find your ideal partner, your soulmate who's out there. Um, so obviously we need to look at media portrayals of romance with a critical eye. Dating scripts are really similar to sexual scripts that we talked about in chapter seven. So these are descriptions of supposedly quote unquote normal behaviors in the context of a date. And traditional dating scripts like men are the ones who ask women out still persist among heterosexual couples, although not among uh, couples of other sexualities. Sexual strategies theory, or SST, suggests that people prioritize characteristics that ensure reproductive success. And this is how you go about choosing your mate. So men want these young, physically attractive partners because they will be able to provide them many uh, fruits of their loins, right? And women want older partners who have access to status and resources. Um, 
one thing is it really depends on the partner status, right? So if the woman is already in a high status job, is making her own money, this becomes problematic. And it also depends on whether you want a short term or a long term relationship. If you're just looking to hook up with someone, you probably don't care about most of this, right? You're looking more at physical attractiveness. Jealousy. Uh, can be really problematic in a relationship. Um, red flags all around here. It can be an excuse for violence and controlling behaviors. So mate retention behaviors are controlling behaviors that serve to keep a partner away from potential rivals and ensure that partner's fidelity and often isolate the partner in the process, which is obviously problematic. So here are four inaccurate myths about marriage. So individuals and their spouses have the same expectations within marriage, unless you've actually talked about it, not necessarily true. Uh, the positive aspects of a relationship will just get better over time. I mean, they will, but if you communicate with each other, that the negative aspects will just disappear once you get married. No, that doesn't happen. Like marriages, like any other relationship in your life, you need to nurture it and work on it. And again, this idea that like, you complete me, uh, which like, it's a great concept, right? But like for a lot of people, they need other types of fulfillment in their lives as well, whether that could be occupational or maybe having kids or even pets, right? So these are some of the benefits of marriage. Obviously social support, things like physical and mental health, um, earnings because you have two incomes most of the time in America now, tax benefits, access to inheritance and social security, access to employer benefits like health insurance um, and next of kin benefits. Um, and these benefits were actually part of the argument that was used in the Supreme Court when uh, they brought down the decision uh, to make same-sex marriage legal nationwide. Um, and the research on marriage is mixed. Some research suggests that it's much more beneficial for men um, and that women are happier when they're single. And some research is mixed. And I think probably a lot of it has to do with the quality of the relationship. All right, so consensually non-monogamous, CNM, <laughs> love that we have to have acronyms for everything, right? Relationships are committed romantic relationships among partners who agree that they can have sexual and or emotional commitments with other people. So these are people who are non-exclusive or have an open marriage, for example. So polygamy is one husband having many wives. It can be tied to religious beliefs or cultural practices. So uh, for example, um, in some sects, not all, of the Mormon faith, uh, this is a practice, um, whereas other cults, for example, embrace this practice. Um, polyamorous relationship are consensual romantic and or sexual relationships with multiple partners, or you might have a, a family that's made up of uh, multiple people living in a house together. So about 5% of Americans are involved in these, and that's probably a much higher percentage than most people think. Um, and there are a few differences in the quality of monogamous and CNM relationships, which again, surprises people. So in terms of power dynamics in relationships, the principle of least interest says that the person who wants a relationship less has greater power in that relationship. Um, so if you're sort of just hanging on, then you have a lot of power over that other person, right? Couples who have equal levels of emotional involvement tend to be more satisfied and have longer relationships. Now, uh, your chapter gets into a lot about the division of labor, which I think is really important here because this is part of uh, gender inequality that's huge in uh, the US and other Western cultures specifically. So women tend to do more of the routine labor, things that have to be done frequently on a regular schedule, uh, things like perhaps doing the dishes every night. And they also have low control labor, tasks in which the person doing them has little control over when and where they get done. So if you're doing something like childcare, for example, you don't get to decide uh, things along those lines. Men tend to do more of the intermittent labor, things that only have to be done occasionally, and there's some leeway so they get to get done. So taking out the garbage, things along those lines, right? Yeah, you could take it out tonight or you could take it out the morning that it has to be on the curb. 
we deal, do still see these divisions of labor even in today's society. So mothers do about twice as much childcare as fathers. Um, there also tends to be this stereotype that if a man is hanging out with his kids, he's babysitting. Certainly uh, couples that I know who are our age don't think of it this way, but this is something that still prevails. Uh, women take on more mental load than men. Uh, the planning, the organizing. So these are things that like you might be thinking about while you're doing other tasks, right? They take up some emotional, uh, some uh, mental space. And then emotion work are tasks that make other people feel loved and cared for. And women do significantly more of that than men. And they're also blamed if this isn't them. Like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do it? Relative resources theory says the person who brings in more resources in the relationship gets used to those gets to use those resources to avoid doing chores. This is the idea of social exchange. It's an economic model of trading goods and services, and you're applying it to interpersonal relationships. It's related to time availability. The person who has the most available time should do a larger proportion of housework. However, this is not always what happens. So even when heterosexual couples work equally full-time, uh, the woman typically ends up doing more of the labor. Gender deviance neutralization is the idea that when people act in a way that's gender atypical in one domain, they can overcompensate by acting in a gender stereotypical way in another domain. Um, so this is why we see some women who out earn their male partners actually doing more domestic labor. Compensating. All right, so again, that's just a quick overview of things for this chapter. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and look forward to reading your discussion posts about relationships. <laughs>